Morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Phil Gibby. I'm the Regional Director for the Arts Council in the southwest of England. Very pleased to welcome you to Watershed today for this, this stimulating session with Michael Kaiser. Um, Arts Council England has been very keen to adopt agendas around private giving and philanthropy, which are going to become increasingly important, we feel, to arts organisations over the next few years. And uh, we, we feel it's right to support organisations as they make progress in those areas over the next four or five years. At the end of last year, we published Endowments in the Arts, a report that was commissioned by the Secretary of State, which outlined the role that we intend to play in moving some of those agendas forward. In the 2011 budget, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, announced a series of substantial reforms to encourage private giving, including plans to simplify gift aid, increase incentives for people to give to charity through inheritance tax breaks, and to consult on extending the acceptance in lieu scheme from inheritance tax to other lifetime taxes. These reforms were recommended in our Endowment in the Arts report, and we hope that the actions we take to invest in organisations' capacity and ability to incentivise giving will be complementary to these actions going forward. In December, we announced that we would invest £50 million over the next five years into an £80 million fund, um, together with the Department for Culture, Media and Sport and the Heritage Lottery Fund, um, for work to support philanthropy and private giving in the cultural sector over the next five years. We plan over the next couple of months to announce specifically how we are going to use that money. The announcement will include details of a matched funding scheme, a programme to support capacity building within arts organisations and a related set of advocacy activities. And that investment process builds on a, a consultation process that we've undertaken in a number of locations with the DCMS over the course of the past few months. We believe that progress in the area of individual giving will be effectively built through action both to changing the culture of giving in England as well as the culture of asking by organisations, taking action to build up and incentivise both the supply and the demand sides. Therefore, we see a, a role for ourselves in helping raise the profile of arts and culture as charitable causes worthy of genuine attention of philanthropists. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you today's speaker, someone who has had enormous success in his career, um, whether with Kansas City Ballet, the Alvin Ailey Dance Theatre, with the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden, and indeed most recently with the Kennedy Centre in Washington DC. Um, he says in his excellent book, which I thoroughly commend to you, The Art of the Turnaround, um, when, when he was young his father advised him to take a career in dentistry on the grounds that it would be a good solid way to make a living. Um, instead he, he travelled the, the more dangerous route into arts management and doesn't seem to have done too badly out of that. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Kaiser. Thank you. It's great to be here today. Don't let the cameras bother you. We're just going to relax. Um, this is going to be a real participatory session. It's by no means a lecture. Um, it's always interesting for me to come to England to talk about fundraising, which I do at least once a year, um, because the reason why we in America know how to do fundraising is because you gave us the Puritans. Um, <laughs> and the Puritans thought that music and dance were evil, and so we had a separation of art and state, which continues to this day in the United States, which meant if we were going to have any art in my country, we were going to have to learn how to pay for it privately. So we feel like we're returning the favor by coming here to teach. Um, I do get a chance to teach all over the world. I've now taught people from 72 countries. And one of the common feelings everywhere, no difference from country to country, is that people find that fundraising is either challenging, difficult, or distasteful. And I would love to hear from you why you find fundraising a challenge. So please, anybody who wants to speak. Somebody. Yes. Because if you could say, into sorry, because uh, um, people don't want to give very easily. It's not easy to get them to give. You know, I think that's true. But I think we in the arts make a mistake a lot because we think of fundraising as begging, as if we're sort of asking, and and if they're nice, they'll give to us. And for me, fundraising is a real transaction. That is, I'm giving something in addition to getting something. And if we make it fun to give, and if we actually think and are a little bit more vocal what we're giving back to the person who gives to us, I think we're going to end up having an easier time. And we'll talk about some of those techniques later this morning. What else makes it challenging to do fundraising? Yeah. I think particularly in this country, people think that the arts are purely entertainment and not the basis of our society. And it's very difficult sometimes to explain to people how important and necessary it is. I think that's right. I think that's a marketing challenge that we have. I, I think that's our fault rather than their fault. 
Um, I don't think we've done a great job of explaining ourselves. Let's compare us to a, to a field that we're always compared to when it comes to particularly corporate giving, which is sport. Um, I think they, I think sports done a much better job of making their case to the public than we have. And I think that's something that we have to think about as we go forward. And we're going to talk about a whole field called institutional marketing today that I think is crucial to making that case. Because I believe, obviously, in my soul that that is true. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in the field. Yeah. I think, I mean, I find, um, we find generally that it's actually a fantastic experience to bring those. It's that, you know, when you get that magic spark in your eyes, you may really believe in the organization. It's phenomenal. It's one of my favorite things to do. But I think the challenge for, for me certainly is balancing the time that it takes to, to cultivate and to manage donors, whether they're kind of prospects or they're already giving, against the need to meet targets. Absolutely. Uh, the, I think it's a huge challenge. How do you balance the time it takes versus the financial needs of the organization? And my approach to that, which we'll, we'll also talk about, I believe we don't give ourselves enough time to cultivate those we need to fund a particular project. I think we rush things a lot. And then we feel very nervous, and then we start pushing. And I think that if we gave ourselves more time, that we would have an easier chance to do this in a way that is better for fundraising, but also better for art making. Yes. I think in the UK, um, people perceive that they're already supporting the arts through their taxes. Absolutely, which makes it even more important to make it seem beneficial to give and means that you're getting something back for giving, so it's not just you're giving again and, and not getting anything extra back. Absolutely. What else? Yes. I think as an extension of that point, actually, that we face quite an ideological challenge here that um, whilst arts is publicly funded, it can be for everyone. And that once you move into a position of philanthropy, that you risk it being agenda driven by people who can afford it. Absolutely. And I think that one of the crucial elements of being good at fundraising is also knowing how to set rules. What you, what you allow the donor, what prerogative you allow the donor, and which ones you don't. And I think that's a very very, very big challenge. Although I have to be honest in saying, when I was here at the Royal Opera House 10 years ago raising money and everyone said to me, you have to watch out, those donors are going to get too much authority, they're going to pick the art, etc. I have to say that in my career, which is now pretty long, I've never had any more pressure from anyone bes more than the Arts Council of England. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so um, and I say that with all due respect, but I, but I, but I, I have, it's about setting rules. There's things you allow a donor to do and the things you don't allow a donor to do. Um, I, I used to run this little ballet company in Kansas City called the Kansas City Ballet. And if you've ever tried selling ballet in Kansas City, which is essentially a cowboy town, um, <laughs> selling anything in England is a lot easier. Um, and, and after I left, um, this local toy store came. They wanted to, to pay for, they wanted to sponsor the annual production of Nutcracker. Um, which is done at Christmas time, and toy stores sell most of their toys at Christmas time, so it made sense for them. But what they wanted was they wanted to put their mascot, which was a moose, in the last scene of Nutcracker. <laughs> um, you don't allow this. I mean, you have to be able to set rules. And, and I think that as countries and as societies get more used to fundraising, you learn to set the rules a little bit more stringently. But it's a very big point, absolutely. What else makes fundraising challenging? Yes. I think it's that thing that you just mentioned about selling ballet to people in Kansas City. I think when you're outside of, um, or the perceptions when you're outside of large cities or outside areas that are perceived as wealthy, and you've got a product that might be unusual or different, it's finding people, it's getting started. How do you prospect? How do you find the right people in your area to Absolutely. make that ask? So all that research side of things, when you haven't um, got fundraisers and you're a small organization and you perhaps don't have a high profile, I know you talk about institutional marketing, but when you're small, Finding the right people to make that ask is challenging. And I promise I'll talk about the institutional marketing we did with the Kansas City Ballet, because I do believe that especially small organizations need to do that t in order to draw people to them, because marketing does become come before fundraising. You have to have the people who care about your work before you can ask for money. What else? What else makes it hard? Anybody? Yes. Yes, let's just pass the mic over. The loud voice. <laughs> It'll help the filming if you do it into the mic. Um, well, I come from, uh, you know, uh, second generation immigrant communities. Mm -hmm. And we find, um, I run an organization that has given voice to the British Asian contemporary experience. Okay. 
And we find that our communities give a lot of money, mm -hmm. but they tend to give back to you know, charitable things in Absolutely. India or the countries that they come from. Absolutely. And it's very hard to convince people that art is a charity. Absolutely. And I do a lot of work um, with organizations that serve specific communities. Um, and in the States, individuals who provide the vast majority of funding in the States and actually are becoming a majority of the funding here in, in, in England, in the States it's 60 to 65 percent of funding for the arts comes from individual givers. For organizations that serve specific communities, it's 6 percent. And, and this is a very big challenge that I've been working on for the last 20 years because I do believe that we need to find ways to bring, because I believe individual donors are, there's so many more of them and they're so much more loyal. How do we start to change that in organizations that do serve specific but also communities? We, we are, um, you know, we're crossing over in terms of who we serve. Absolutely. And who but, uh, and we find that in terms of donations, it's very difficult. I, I'm not going to tell you it's not, but I'm going to tell you that there are ways to move the bar. I used to run an, a dance company called the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. It's an African-American dance company. It's, it's faced the exact same issues of not being, of a, the African-American community in the United States is incredibly generous, but they tend to be generous to church and to education and not to arts. And having, we had to move that, and I'll talk about the way we did that, right, as we talk this morning. Let me talk about some of the, these are some of the challenges. Let me talk about how I view fundraising, how I think one has to, can do it to make it easier. Um, first of all, in my experience, the one thing that's absolutely central and crucial to a successful fundraising organization, but obviously also to a successful organization, is exactly one thing, and that's the quality and excitement of the art. And when I use the word art, I'm using that word very generally because some of you are educational organizations, so that's, it's programming I'm talking about, the quality of your programming. And I find that to do really good fundraising on a sustained basis, you have to have exciting, important, surprising, quality art. And to me, this is the prerequisite. It's a good news because that's also what we need to fulfill our missions of our organizations. But it's sad to me because I look around the world and I see so many organizations and so many communities where art making has lost some of its vitality, has lost some of its dreaminess, where artists are so scared about money that they're not really making the art they want to make, and they're not making art that's big enough, surprising enough, or challenging enough. And I see a lot of arts organizations that do Beethoven's Fifth Symphony one year, and the Sixth Symphony the next year, and the Third Symphony the next year, and the Seventh Symphony the next year, and they think that is changing the art. And and they end up looking just a little bit routine and dull in their communities. And that makes it extremely hard to fundraise. And for me, creating important art then is, is central to good fundraising. And I have found that a lot of arts organizations don't give themselves enough time to create their art. And let me ask you just to raise your hands. For your organizations, how many of you plan your artistic projects at least one year in advance? Great, that's a very healthy number. How many of you plan your art at least two years in advance? Good. How many of you plan your art at least three years in advance? How many of you plan your art at least four years in advance? Okay, we lost you there, okay. Um, I'm gonna make a case for planning art four or five years in advance, knowing there are lots of caveats, and after, let me make my case, and then you can tell me why I'm wrong, okay? But let me start by making my case. I have a very simple chart that's sort of my Bible. I have the next five seasons, the 12, 11, 12, 12, 13. I'm going to change this marker in a second. Okay, and under each of these seasons, I list all the projects that I think I want to do in those years. Okay. These markers don't want to cooperate. And I typically have more in the early years and fewer in the out years. And I spend a lot of time thinking about projects in the out years, and let me tell you why. 
Number one, I find that if you only give yourself a year to plan your project, your years aren't going to look that much different from each other because you don't have a lot of time to find the resources to do something bigger or more special. If you only have six months or eight months to find resources for a project, it's not a lot of time to cultivate. You were saying cultivation takes time, and it does take time. This year, my biggest project at the Kennedy Center was a festival of Indian culture. We took five years to make this very large festival. We had the theater and the music and the dance of, of India. We had the poetry and the literature of India. We had both contemporary and classical arts. We had the food of India. We had the fabrics and the jewelry of India. It was a very large look at the, at the culture of India. It took us five years to put it together. It took us a couple of years just to really investigate the field, figure out who we wanted to bring, figure out which of the artists were the best in their genre, to build relationships with the artists, to do the contracting, just to get the visas took a year, and to do the marketing and the fundraising. We took five years to make this very large project. It was a big, surprising, exciting project that transformed my center for a month and really surprised my audience. To me, that kind of project is a gold mine when it comes to creating financial health as well. But it starts from the art. It starts from what it is we're trying to express. And we gave ourselves the luxury of five years. I think one's art can be more substantial if you give yourself more time. But also, I think you can raise mo money more easily. The problem we have in the arts is if we're only talking to a donor, mostly we do at the next project we're doing, we come up to the donor and we start talking. We tend to talk too much when we fundraise and listen not enough. But we talk and talk and talk about this project, why you need to support it, how great it's going to be. This donor, this prospect, may have no interest in that project. It just may not be of interest. And either they'll give you a little token gift or they'll give you nothing. Whereas what I do when I meet a donor is I ask them what their interests are. It is not, please, to your point, that I create a project to make them happy. I don't do that. But what I do is when I hear what your interests are, I can pick from my menu of projects which one I think is most likely to interest you. So maybe it's that one right there. Maybe you're really interested in, in Shakespeare and I'm planning a big Shakespeare project. And so rather than try and force you to be interested in this project, I'm happy to get you interested in this project. And I find you get much more gifts that way and much bigger gifts that way. That's where the big gifts come from. It doesn't come from forcing someone. And so I really do believe in giving oneself the time to think through what is it you want to do, to let your artist dream. And then, instead of saying, no, we can't afford that dream, to say, you know what? We can afford that dream, but we can't afford it today. Let's put it four years from now and give ourselves the time to find the resources for it. To me, this helps also one last thing, which is to reduce the tension that often exists between the artistic side and the administrative side or financial side. You know, in a lot of situations, I see that the artists and the artistic director act like naughty children. I want this, I want this, I want this. And the administrator acts like an angry parent. No, 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 we can't afford it. It's a completely useless dynamic, and it's, it's completely wrong-headed because the only job of the administrator is to make the artist's dreams come true. That's it. That's the job. When I'm an art administrator, my job is to find the resources to allow the artist to do their work, not to sit there and say, this is, can happen, this can't happen. And what I do when I talk to an artist who says, I want to do this, 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 is I start to array it over a number of years, all that list. And I can go back to the artist and say, OK, how does this pattern look to you if we do this this year, this next year, this year after? And a lot of times they'll make changes, or can we do this first, can we do this second? But I always find that they're so happy I listen to them and that I really want to get them everything they want that we end up having a much more collegial relationship and that tension starts to evaporate. So for all these reasons, I believe this is a smarter way to go. But now please tell me all the reasons you think this is a bad thing. Yes. Can we have a microphone over here? Do we have another microphone? Can we maybe keep one up and one down so that we can? It's over here. Um, perhaps the impatience of donors who want quick results for their yes. cash injections. We will have always projects we're doing now, 
And once you get started on this, you're always doing a full slate every year. And if there's a donor who says, I need to do something today, then you find something from today's list. But what I find is there's, there's more donors who say, I'm not going to give unless this project really interests me. And so I'm trying to take care of that donor. Now, for each donor, once we get started with this, I'm constantly talking several years ahead with, with our major donors so that there's always something them for them to fund in each year, but what they're funding is something that they first thought about two or three years before. Yes. Is it on? Yes. Oh, great. Um, I'm, I'm not saying this is a bad idea, but um, what I'm concerned about, our organization focuses on working with artists at, at, well, emerging practitioners. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so often the artists that we're working with are still in college in five, <laughs> in five <laughs> yeah, years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, five years' time. They're, they're still in college now. So how does one <laughs> um, develop this kind of strategy for planning while leaving the selection and the, and the, the decision, the artistic decisions sort of open? It's a great question, and, and I have several answers to it. Number one, I do it in pencil. <laughs> I'm constantly moving things around for lots of reasons. I have an idea, it's going to take a little longer. Or I have an idea, I could actually move that one up. Or I have an idea, and it's a bad one, let's take it out. I'm constantly moving things around, number one. Number two, I also feel, I also leave some slots blank. I'm not saying every project has to be planned five years out. I'm thinking about some of the bigger things that we couldn't do unless we gave ourselves the time. All right? And then number three, a lot of times I'm thinking of themes rather than thinking of specific works. Th does that make sense? Or I'm thinking about an artist I'd like to work with, but don't know what the work's going to be because it's going to be a new work. So last year I did three plays by the American playwright Terence McNally. Two of them, Masterclass and Lisbon Traviata, existed, those I could program. I wanted him to write a new play. I had no idea what it was going to be. But I could work with him early enough to get on his calendar so that when we did this project, I had the new play. Th does that make sense? So, so, and I find that a lot of times arts organizations say, I could never work with this artist. I could never work with this great playwright. I could never work with this great singer or this great actor or this great director because they won't care about me. And it's true, if you go to them and say, can you work with us in six months, they'll say, no, I'm busy. But if you say, I'd love to work with you in four years, <laughs> very often you can get on their calendar and, and they feel like they really have the time to plan a project that would be interesting to them. So I find even for newer work that starting to think early really can be helpful. Um, I just wanted to mention that in, well, in England I suppose we've, we are very, very stuck in the rut of looking for fundraising from charities, arts council, etc. Yes. And all of those are very hatch, match and dispatch. Yes. Um, so obviously we've got to completely change the way we approach things here. But for us starting afresh and shifting away from those organisations, how do we gain trust and, and a belief from the corporate sponsors actually that we can, we can even deliver? You know, we've got no track record of doing this basically. So. Well, there's some in this country. There's maybe not as much as you would like. Yeah. I'm not saying you get rid of the old funders. I'm saying that if you want to build your fundraising, you're going to have to amplify with new funders. Because what I am concerned about is always going back to the same three to five donors for every project. And if you only give yourself that six or eight months, you're almost doomed to only go back to the same funder because you don't have time to cultivate the new ones. Let's take the India Festival I mentioned. We raised 80% of the money that we had to raise, and we had to raise a lot, it was a big project. We raised 80% from donors who had never heard of us five years earlier. Or if they had, it was just sort of very bland in the, in the far distance. They had never funded us. We had the time to research and cultivate and then to solicit a whole new set of donors because we took the time to do that and we had the length of time to do all of that work. So I believe if you're going to build your funding base away from Arts Council, two major foundations and one or two corporations and maybe a couple of individuals, if you're going to broaden the base, which I think is crucial, I absolutely believe that this way makes it easier to do that because it gives you the time. Try it with one project. Don't try and do it with everything. Just pick one project that you would love to think about. Sit back with a glass of wine in your living room in a nice cool place and just dream about a project you'd love to do that you could never imagine doing 
in a one-year time frame. But just start dreaming about a project and plan it for four years from now or five years from now and see if you can't make that work. I think what you'll do is you'll be seduced <laughs> into finding that actually this makes it easier to raise money. <coughs> and also, we're doing so much planning as we go along and so much discussion as we go along that when we get to the project, we're not running around crazy because things have been thought through. The Ken at the Kennedy Center, we do 2,000 performances a year. If we didn't spend a lot of time thinking about them early, we would be going bonkers every day because there's five different performances a day. So we find this becomes a necessity. Again, not for every project, but for the bigger ones. It really allows us to, to really think things through and to make things be in place and to make the money be in place. Yes, one more comment and then we're going to move on. Could I step oh, in? Oh, sure. Sure, we'll do this and then we'll do this. Would that be okay? That'd be great. Um, just following on from Carolyn's question, I think uh, it's absolutely right. We are going to have a real culture change. I, my question is, um, the, the issue around how development, um, people who are working in development, how do they work with the programming teams? Th can you hold on that for one minute? I promise I'll get there in probably 10 minutes. If you could hold on for 10 minutes. If I don't do it well enough, then you can jump on me, okay? <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> got fragments of a five-year plan in place but aren't going to be able to reach that unless we address April next year. Absolutely. Have you got tips, please? Yes, you have to work on two fronts at the same time. You have to work on the, on the current because you can't go, there's no point planning five years out if you're bankrupt in six months. Mm -hmm. So you have to work on two fronts. But what I'm trying to say is to get yourself, your organization started on this longer-term thinking because what you'll find is as you get closer to that longer term event, you're going to start, you can add, you can start to change the way your organization functions. You absolutely, I have to do some short term fundraising as well. But the weight of my fundraising is now is longer term and that makes it easier for my organization and it lets me sleep better. So you've got to do, you've got to work short term, long term, but over time the weights are going to change. If you started today, 95% of your time will be in the short term. But over the next three years, you'll move more and more of it into long term, and that will make it easier for you to raise money, particularly from new donors. 